G'day, Dylan O'Donnell here from the Byron Bay Observatory. As you can see, I'm well on the way to winning that case of beer in Easter. I look like a homeless person or a cult leader. Either way, that's fine by me. Now, the horse head is one of the most iconic images in astrophotography and chess. Uh, I could tell you that it's 1,500 light years away, but honestly, who the f cares? Everything in space is far away. And in fact, your human brain can't even really fathom that number. Even if at an intellectual level, you know what that means, your spatial reasoning, your spatial ability in your mind has no idea what that means. So once again, this year, I've been shooting the Horsehead Nebula, but this time we're gonna do one of those things, uh, that series that I do where I deep dive into one of those images. We are going to go deep into the horse head, deeper into a horse than you've ever been before. Except you, Greg, you know what you did. My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you're watching Star Stuff. Before we get going, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the show sponsor, High Point Scientific. High Point Scientific are an American vendor of astronomy equipment. So if you have any brand that you're interested in, they stock a wide range. They have no incentive to sell one particular brand. They will support your astrophotography journey. So if you have questions or you are trying to get going with something, they'll help you out to get you there and they have a price match guarantee. So there really is no reason why you shouldn't be using them. I could tell you their link, www. you guess it, but I want you to click those links down the bottom because I got a kickback on those links and I love money. So I've recently revisited the Horsehead Nebula. We do this as astrophotographers, revisit the same things over and over, particularly as we upgrade our setup. And this year I'm shooting it with the QHY 268M, which is such a beautiful 16-bit camera with such a good high dynamic range. I thought it would be really appropriate for this particular target. I was really excited to see what it turned out like. I used hydrogen alpha for the red channel and separate runs of green and blue to combine as a HAGB image, uh, which is the same sort of technique I use for galaxies. But honestly, as nice as this wide field is, the Bright Star Alnitac wreaks absolute havoc on the image. My diffraction spikes caused by the cabling in front of the Rasa even went in different directions for the G and the B channels because there was a meridian flip in between each of these runs, which effectively turns the sensor upside down. This doesn't normally make a difference unless you have these insane diffraction spikes which suddenly change direction. So I wanted to go deeper into the horse head and use a higher magnification. I threw in the C11, the Celestron 11 inch Edge HD SET telescope and that unlocks 1960 millimeter focal length. So quite zoomed in. But before we do that, let's consult the Holy Bible, Robert Burnham's Celestial Handbook. Now I did have a little mini documentary about Robert Burnham and why this book is so crazy and important. Uh, it got flagged for copyright for the sad piano music. So I just have to put some more sad piano music on and I'll upload that shortly. So if you see this 
double upload about Robert Burnham. That's why I don't like to double upload, but I have to repost that one. And let's see what he has to say about the horse head. This is the famed Dark Horsehead Nebula, undoubtedly the best known example of a dark nebula in the entire heavens. However, it is almost completely invisible to the eye at the telescope and requires long exposure photographs to reveal its strange and spectacular details. See, it's not just me sledging visual astronomers. Now I think, I think this image is pretty cool because this is closer to what I'm getting with my equipment, except this one is a 200 inch reflector at the Palomar Observatory. So you can see how far we've come. That said, it is very good quality. You can see the stars are resolved quite nicely and the detail in this is really crisp. So even pre-digitally, uh, they did very well with the right equipment. Here's the wider region and we do have to pay attention to this star here, Sigma Orionis, because it is actually responsible for the glow here. We think about Alnitak being responsible because it's so big and bright, but it's actually this star here that's causing all of this illumination. You can see the book dedicates a lot of time to the horse head and there's the wider region, but for a nicer image for YouTube, see Sky Guide. Now, earlier I said it was hard for your brain to fathom spatially where exactly the horse head is. So here's a nice little map your puny human brain will understand. Now, obviously this is not what space looks like. This is a cartoon version of a galaxy that we live in, uh, but you can see roughly where you are here and you can see roughly where the horse head is here. So because these two things are basically in the same region, essentially right next door, that's why we can see it. And that's really the same for all the other bright nebula in the sky too. There's obviously a lot more nebula in our galaxy that we just can't see because it's not in our line of sight. So if you're following along at home and you have your own photo already, an astro photo that you've taken of the Horsehead Nebula, take it out now and deep dive with me. Let's look at what's actually going on in this picture. Okay, so here's the color view of the whole region. Uh, we can see Alnitak here, uh, looking like a huge pain in the ass as usual. And we assume that this is what's causing the nebulosity through here, the ionized hydrogen, but actually it's from this star, Sigma Orionis. Um, so this is causing a whole lot of sort of solar wind coming down this way, and it's causing all of this to glow. However, there's something odd about this nebulosity. If we look at the hydrogen alpha here, you might notice this stri these striations that you don't see on other nebula. They're really distinct lines, right? Looking at the wider area, you can see these striations here. They seem to flare up out this way and I don't know, maybe it's just my eye, they seem to curve too. Now this is, I've just learned because of Sigma Orionis. According to Wikipedia, it's because of the magnetic energy coming off. So this, this will have like a magnetic field radiating out this way. We superimpose, say, the sun on here. This is a theoretical model of the, of the stellar magnetism around the star. Uh, now, I don't know which way this star would have to be placed um, because I assume the star is rotating. So if it's rotating, how can it cause these striations here? Shouldn't it also move? Over time, should we not be seeing these striations move? Has anyone compared the striations from 10 years ago to now? I don't think this is a variable nebula. This star also must be fairly close to this region as well. The heliosphere extends right out past Pluto and the sun is in a bubble where it's affected by those solar winds. But if the solar winds are coming all the way out here, that means that this sphere of influence for this star might be all the way around here. Now does that mean this is all within one solar system? Like do they, does it have a region of planets that extend this far? If that's the case we're looking at a very small area. I don't know the answers and it threw up a whole bunch more questions for me. So I just think it's interesting because it's not something I've observed in any other nebula. But it does get you thinking about how all of this is laid out, uh, which leads me on to the next thing, the backlighting. Now in the color version, we can see some very distinct differences between the red and the really orangey look of the flame nebula down here. 
Uh, now the flame is really interesting I think because to me it looks like it's backlit from within. Uh, we see this black uh, extinction here but clearly the light is coming from behind it so there's some activity there that we can't see. Here we know that uh, Sigma Orionis is lighting from this direction but a funny thing is happening to the horse. Uh, for starters, well this is easy to see in HA, you might notice, let me just zoom in here, have you ever noticed how there's a kind of shiny ridge along the edge here? And that to me indicates that this is also backlit, which seems obvious because it's obviously in front of the ionized hydrogen that's glowing. It's probably more obvious, but we can see the light comes in from behind and it also generates this shadow out this way. And I think that gives a really cool 3D perception of what we're looking at. To be able to see the depth that way and to see a shadow cast across the rest of the dust cloud, it's mind blowing. Okay, now I've hopped over to Pix Insight, and this is something really cool you can do with any image, is trying to find the faintest stars. They're the stars with the higher magnitude number in your image. And a good place to start is after you've solved the image uh, with the image solver script, open the image annotation script in the render menu. Now go down to Gaia, and that's the main catalog from the Gaia mission, which has cataloged a whole bunch of stars. And down here, Go to the magnitude filter and change the magnitude all the way down to 3 so you get the bright stars and I'm going to start with 16 then hit preview. Okay my image was solved upside down so I apologise for this being upside down but you can see it's labelled all the stars here. We've got a mag 7, is that 7? Yeah mag 7, 11, 13, uh, but it's missing some of these fainter ones here because remember we set that limit to 16 so it's getting all the way up to 15 point whatever 15.9 there but not hitting these other ones we know that there is star formation happening here which we can't see because of the extinction uh, however let's try and capture some of these fainter stars and see how far my telescope can resolve to so I'll close this change the mag filter to 18 okay now you'll see it's picking up a lot more of those stars that it missed before and we're getting all the way down to 17.9 here look it's barely on the edge of perception here I'm gonna push it all the way to 20 why not now even though this is labeled some of these 19s you can see they're not clear in my image I can definitely see something around 18.8 but I'm seeing nothing in 19.7. Uh, but it is interesting to see that the limit, as far as I can tell, is gonna be about 19. Anything over that, mm, it, anything over that, I think you're using your imagination to maybe see something in the noise there. But it is a really fun experiment to do with your own images, run them through this process, see how faint you can get and set yourself a competition to maybe see if you can find the faintest star possible with your particular telescope. I think the backyard record is 22. Don't quote me on that, it may have even been broken by now. Uh, but that is an interesting competition you can set for yourself. Okay, now this blows my mind a fair bit as well. If we go back into PixInsight and go into the uh, image annotation script where we were before measuring magnitudes we can go down here and you can see we can we can actually label more than just magnitudes so use that drop down menu there to select parallax and uh, I've got this set from magnitude 3 to 18.5 because we know that's around the limit of uh, what I'm capturing here I'll hit preview so I can see and what this does is it gives us an image with both the magnitude measurement for the stars but also parallax and parallax isn't a measure of distance but it is halfway to measuring the distance it is an indication of distance so if we go into the stars close to the horse head here uh, for instance we see this one is a 17 mag star with a, a parallax of 1.6 now we look at some of these bright ones and the parallax is far higher 2.5 5.1 uh, this one looks like it's 0.8 so the lower the number is the further it is away 
and the higher the number is the closer it is to earth so this actually allows us a kind of three-dimensional view we can see which of these stars are maybe even behind the horse head and some of these low reading numbers are either in the horse head or behind them and shining through <clears throat> this uh, this one here 0.4 that's definitely behind it uh, but some of these other bright ones 2.3 that's closer to us so we can actually kind of x-ray the image uh, which I think is fantastic I know that uh, these are this is a giant star here, so 2.4 parallax, it's quite close to us, but it's also huge. I think that's quite amazing to look at these images this way. We're used to seeing the star field as this homogeneous blob of white dots, but if we can see the parallax as well, we can work out which of those dots are closer to us and which of them are further away. Again, truly mind blowing. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that deep dive into the Horsehead Nebula. It's really good to sometimes sit back and really observe what we've captured here and unwind what's going on in these images instead of just looking at them as pretty pictures and moving on, which you can do and it's fine. Uh, but there is a lot going on that if we don't take the time to stop and think about it, we may never realise. Anyway, my name is Dylan O'Donnell. You've been watching Star Stuff. Remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. <laughs>